the Purnendo Chatterjee Chair in Energy Technologies at the Department of Physics and Department of Material Science at the Engineering and Engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. He is also the Associate Laboratory Director of the Energy Technologies area at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. He also served as the Founding Director of the successful Department of Energy Sunshot Initiative envisioning and coordinating the R&D funding of the U.S. solar program, spearheading the reduction in the cost of solar energy. Professor Ramesh is renowned for his work on the synthesis and materials physics of complex functional oxide materials. His extensive public publications on the same topics with over 65,000 citations and a H factor of 144 has been recognized with the Thomas Thomson Reuters Citation Laureate in Physics. He has also been conferred with several other accolades and laurels, including the Alexander von Humboldt Senior Scientist Prize, the APS McGrody New Materials Prize, the TMS Bardeen Prize, and the IUPAP Magnetism Prize and the Neil Medal. He is also a fellow of the APS, the AAAS, the MRS, and is also a foreign member of the Royal Society of London as well as the Indian National Science Academy. Our distinguished guest was the first to demonstrate that conducting oxide electrodes eliminate the 30 year old problem of polarization fatigue. Together with his pioneering work in ferroelectric thin films, this was a crucial step towards the development of reliable high density, non-volatile random access memory or FRAMS. He also initiated research into the fields of manganite thin films and coined the term of colossal magnetoresistive oxides in 1994. His group has also demonstrated the electric field control of both ferro and antiferromagnetism using multiferroics, and this cutting-edge research has enabled the development of ultra-low power information storage, sensors, detectors, and logic units. Thank you so much, sir, for taking time out of your busy schedule to enlighten us on the latest research and developments in the field of ferroelectrics. We are really looking forward to your lecture. Thank you, Tarun. And thank you, Professor Raman and the metal team. By the way, anybody there remembers Aditya Mishra? Does anybody know Aditya Mishra? He graduated about a year ago from NIT. Anyway, um, I was there in 2018 for Pragyan. Does that make sense? Pragyan is your cultural event. It seems like it was such a recent event, but it's been already three years. So it's a pleasure to be there remotely. I hope you guys are all doing well. I hope most of you, at least a significant number of you are vaccinated and safe. Anyway, so um, without much ado, let me go to my talk. First, Tarun, can you see my screen? Yes, sir, your screen is visible. Very good. Okay. So um, when Rishika asked me to give this talk, I said, um, what would you like me to speak on? And um, I gave her two topics and she picked this topic. Uh, it turns out it's actually a very interesting business. So I thought I'll share a little bit of, we're having a lot of fun doing this. Amidst all the COVID and everything else, we are having a lot of fun. So what these are, are actually mathematical um, um, structures in some sense. They're all topological structures. And you can see the picture on the left side is one of them. It's called a polar skirmion. Actually, more formally, it's called a Huffion. Uh, um, Huff was a mathematician who discussed a lot of these kinds of details. Okay. So we call it ethos, emergent topological and hierarchical ordered structures. All right. Uh, before I start, acknowledge my my colleagues, my group members, uh, Lane Martin used to be my student. Now he's my colleague, he's a professor here. He's a department chair here at Material Science. Saif Salahuddin, very smart guy. And he's in electrical engineering here. Collaborators around the world. We love to collaborate with people. 
And one of my former postdocs is at NIT, Hemalata. She's in the physics department. And hello to her if she's there. And of course, we work with a whole bunch of people. And uh, like everywhere else, you know, we could not do it without the funding. In our case, the Department of Energy, the Army Research Office, these MURIs are multidisciplinary programs. Okay, so the question is, uh, what are we talking about? I thought I'll start with the brief history of ferroelectricity. It turns out, um, I will describe what ferroelectricity is in a just uh, a minute. This is essentially the 100th, it's actually 101 year anniversary of uh, ferroelectricity. Hey, Tarun, can you hear me well? Yes, sir, you're audible. Very good, very good, okay, yeah. Just holler if I'm speaking too low voice or speaking too fast or whatever. So it turns out 1920 was the first discovery of ferroelectricity. I'm gonna tell you a little bit what ferroelectricity is. But if you look at this chart, this is like a timeline chart from a review article we're just in the process of publishing. That's the first discovery of ferroelectricity. And that's Professor Kittel's work. He was a colleague of ours here. He just passed away a few years ago. And of course, you guys know this very well. If you're in the physics department, uh, you cannot live life without Landau and Lifshitz. Their fantastic book uh, is basically, you know, it said everything. And that's the Nobel Prize for Lev Landau. And uh, Lars von Sager, he also won the Nobel Prize. He talked about vortices in superfluids, and we will come to that in a second. And Abrikosov, Anatoly Abrikosov uh, won the Nobel Prize as well in 1996, 97, I think, for vortices in superconductors. That's the Abrikosov lattice. And then a few years ago, two years ago, David Thaulus and Michael Kosterlitz, and uh, they won the Nobel Prize uh, for topology. And we will get to that in a second. These are real space topology. And then uh, there was some work in the 90s on toroidal dipole moments, vortices in barium titanate. This fellow, Laurent Belache, is a very good theorist, fantastic theorist. And he had predicted some stuff that nobody really paid attention. Yeah. There was some, some work on very thin films of some ferroelectrics, but really the whole thing started taking off when uh, some experimental work started happening. And you will see that this is the timeline. And as you go into the 2010s, things start to get more and more intense. All of this was theoretical work. There are a few experiments, which really wasn't that exciting. And then there was some, some uh, description of closure domains and stuff like that. But the real big thing happened. Uh, one of uh, the students in my group, actually, he discovered Ajay Yadav, he was from IIT Kanpur. Uh, he, just, he was trying to make super lattices, which I'll get to in a second. He discovered these really fantastic uh, spiraling structures. And that triggered a lot of different things. And you will see that there's a whole bunch of work that's happening. What I'm going to try to do is to cover for you some of these things. So what's happening here from the materials perspective, from the physics perspective, and why is this so exciting? Okay, that's kind of the focus. Okay, so let's start with the, the, the beginning. What are ferroelectrics, and, and especially what are perovskite ferroelectrics? So uh, you can look at this in many different ways. You can now you can use ab initio kind of calculations, but the classical way to think about this, if, if you go back to your thermodynamics classes, if there are graduate students there, you look at your thermodynamics classes, you can write down the free energy functional, right? And either the Gibbs free energy or the Helmholtz free energy, then you can say you can expand it in terms of the order parameter. For us, that order parameter is this value uh, is the polarization or the displacement more, more generally, okay? Now, the material that we're gonna look at is called a perovskite. It's got the structure. It's got the A, B, O3 structure. You can see the, the three oxygen atoms. There are six oxygen, each shared by one half unit cell. So you get the three oxygens. The A site is the green. The B site is the blue. And the B site is typically the smaller ion. Titanium, for example, titanium plus four. Okay, so um, let's erase all of this stuff. So if you write down the free energy for a material such as barium titanate, this is a good example. Barium titanate or lead titanate, PBTiO3. Okay. If you write down the free energy for that, 
at a certain temperature, you will see that the free energy looks like this. So that's something that we're going to pay attention to. And this is a very classical double well structure. It comes about when you write down the free energy expansion, the second and the fourth and the sixth order terms. It comes about because of the signs of the various uh, coefficients. They're called the Landau coefficients. Okay. So when that happens, you will start to see at a certain temperature that instead of being something like this, where there is no order parameter, it's zero, the material will start to have two order parameters. That's one way to think about it, which is the so-called mean field or the Landau uh, approximation uh, for this. The other way is to ask the question, what happens to this titanium ion? And it turns out that high temperatures is going back and forth at a very high frequency. But as you cool it down more and more and more, that frequency will start to decrease. And at one point, it'll become a spontaneous distortion. It'll move, for example, in the down direction. It was average zero, it starts to go into the down direction or the up direction. Okay. That gives you the A state and the B state. Okay. So um, summary of all of this discussion, let titanate a prototypical ferroelectric, it's a perovskite. There is a very strong role of the local electronic structure. For example, in the lead ion, there's a very large contribution from the success electrons. Those electrons are very far away from the nucleus, so they're essentially free to run around. You know, like some of you guys are far away from your home, you're from North India, you're hanging out in Trichy, so you're having a lot of fun. Okay, that's kind of the approximate way to think about this. Okay. Therefore, that polarizability gives these kinds of materials, that tighten it, for example, a very large spontaneous polarization. Okay. So the ferroelectric polarization is also related to the lattice distortion. That's one thing that one needs to take away from the physics perspective, that in ferroelectrics, although this is supposed to be a dipole moment, that dipole moment is very strongly coupled to the lattice. And therefore, whenever a material becomes a ferroelectric, invariably, there is a very strong lattice distortion of the order of a few percent. In ferromagnets, that doesn't happen. OK, so the con conventional thinking until maybe about five, 10 years ago, the conventional thinking was that ferroelectrics are materials where the structural anisotropy or the distortion of the unit cell is very dominant. And therefore, people always believe that dipoles do not like to rotate like in a ferromagnet, because unlike a spin, which is not a mutable quantity, in the case of a dipole moment, you have a positive and a negative. And that gives you a dipole, but I can keep moving them closer and closer. And I could change the magnitude of the dipole. So people always believe that anytime you're manipulating a ferroelectric, the dipole moment magnitude changes. The question is, is that really true? And it turns out in the last 10 years or so, we're discovering that that's not true, that many ferroelectrics actually behave like a ferromagnet. Okay. So that's kind of a long winded introduction to ferroelectrics. The other part of it which drove a lot of these discoveries is epitaxy. And somebody like me, uh, I am primarily a condensed matter physicist who uses epitaxy, uh, creating artificial materials using the principles of epitaxy. And a good example of epitaxy, a simple example, is just how, how you build an apartment. You may be, I mean, even in Trichy, you have a lot of apartment complexes which are now five to ten stories uh, tall. They're basically epitaxial structures because you use the foundation and you start to just build it up. Yeah. So using epitaxy, you can do strain engineering. You can compress or stretch materials because they like to conform to the underlying substrate. You can break symmetry, for example. You can take a material which has inversion symmetry and you break your symmetry and induce inversion symmetry. You can epitaxially stabilize new phases. You can make nanocomposites, three-dimensional epitaxial structures, uh, which are look very much like a cigarette box. You know, a cigarette box is basically 10 pillars of the cigarettes embedded in a rectangular box. These look very much like that. Or you can start to create artificial interfaces where the electronic structure at the interface is dramatically different. Or you can dope materials using polar or electrostatic effects. Or you can do dimensional confinement where you take one material and confine it in all three dimensions. So epitaxy is now a very powerful way, almost the same as growing a single crystal. If anything, it's a lot more powerful because you can do all of these things. Okay, 
So we use epitaxy as a building block, a fundamental building block. And what I'm going to talk about today is essentially only the system. Although there is hundreds of different compounds with various order parameters that you can have, we're going to talk about lead titanate and strontium titanate. And actually, this picture that you see there is basically an atomic resolution image. This is all unit cells of lead titanate. I'm going to say it's PT. This is unit cells of strontium titanate. And you can easily see that because the lead is a heavier atom, bigger atom. These atomic positions are much bigger. While the strontium is this guy, it's smaller. Atomic number is 38, lead is 82. So you have a much bigger nucleus that's, that's shown in these images. <clears throat> the other thing that you could do, you could start to put gradients, uh, polar gradients, elastic gradients in the compliances of the material, dielectric gradients, gradients in the Landau potential. And then you can become even more fancy. You can start to put the spin and the orbital and the charge degrees of freedom. Right now, we have a lot of work going on on the spin degree of freedom, magnetism, for example. I don't know if I'll have time to get into it, but you know, if you have questions, we can chat. Okay, so our building block is something like, very much like building an apartment. Okay, now we started doing this for a very different reason back in 2012, 2013. These are the these spiraling dipoles that Ajay found, and that was published in this paper. Um, so what I was talking about was um, what determines the formation of these kinds of textures. And basically, it's the interplay between the elastic energy and the electrostatic energy. Hey, Tarun, if you don't see the screen going forward, just let me know, OK? Yeah, sure, sir. All right, OK. So um, we did quite a bit of theoretical work. You will see a little bit more. But basically, what this was saying is that everything that we had assumed about ferroelectrics was likely not true. Ideally, it would have formed domains which were like this. And indeed, if you make this very thick, that's what it would do. It would form very classical structures. But when you confine it in a certain dimensional scale, it starts to form these non-classical structures, very topological structures. And one way, actually, it's an important physics way to think about this, is to ask the question, what's the curl of the polarization? In a normal ferroelectric, the curl, which is the del cross P, should be zero. But in these guys, you can see the plot in D is basically the curl. The color coding tells you kind of the magnitude of the curl of the polarization. Okay. So that tells you that something really interesting is happening in these systems. If you look at uh, phase field calculations, which is kind of a macroscopic technique to, uh, to look at what happens, you actually see exactly what we see. You can see these rotating spiraling uh, patterns. And if you look at them from the top, it looks like a bunch of snakes or carbon nanotubes sitting around. And if you look at electron microscopy, you actually see those. And this is a picture of just a, a tri-layer structure, strontium titanate, lead titanate, strontium titanate. And you can see that these vortices go like tubes. And the dimensions of the tubes are about five nanometers. Okay. And so they're all aligned along one direction. This is the uh, specific one, one bar zero direction for the substrate. Uh, but you could also see, I put these smiley faces, inverted and, and straight up smiley faces. Each one of those is a dislocation. I'm sure you guys have started uh, learning about dislocations. And you can see this is a condensation of two dis different dislocations. This is, would be a dislocation loop. And these are pairs of dislocations. And it turns out that this is a precursor to the Costellus and Thaulus type of phase transition. So what Costellus and Thaulus said back in the 70s was that in 2D systems, um, the phase transition, and if you look, <clears throat> Look at Professor Merman's uh, really beautiful paper. And they talk about what happens in two dimensions. If you have three dimensions, you have no problem in getting a magnetic phase transition. But if you have two dimensions, typically what that would say is you cannot condense into a ground state, which is the magnetic state. Instead, you will have correlations, which are very long range, uh, logarithmic kind of correlations, uh, which will break up the long range order. Of course, we now know that you can, you can modify that by putting a very strong anisotropy. There are 2D magnets now, which are pretty stable. But anisotropy plays a role. But if there is no anisotropy, that magnetic state is not supposed to be stable. 
And one way that this, this system accommodates that is by forming pairs of dislocations. Those dislocations, as you guys know from your classes, the dislocations have a logarithmic uh, strain field uh, around the core of the dislocation. So these pairs of dislocations are thought to be the precursors for how the system accommodates uh, 2D phase transition. Okay. The other thing, and for, I'm sure you guys do a lot of metallurgy uh, uh, in India, we used to do here, but not anymore as much. But if you look at metallurgy in the 1930s and 40s, there was a big debate going on as to how melting, a melting of a piece of aluminum or copper happened. And people thought one of the theories from Nabarro and Friedel, Jacques Friedel, was that melting could be thought of as the point at which the shear modulus for a dislocation goes to zero, which means if you have a bunch of dislocations sitting in the system, they could freely move. And so you could look at that as a precursor for how, how um, Kasterlis and Taulis started to think about you know, these kinds of vortex binding, unbinding transitions in superconductors okay, and led to their, their Nobel Prize. Now, you could also see the, these other boundaries in the system. These are antiphase boundaries, and I'm going to show you some really cool data about these in a few minutes. Okay, now, um, it also turns out that these patterns are something which are very fascinating. I'm sure you guys have heard of Turing. Alan Turing was a mathematician back in the 40s and 50s. And so he looked at pattern formation in many different uh, fields. This is basically dislocations in titanium. And you can see this is uh, five angstroms. Uh, this is the, the vortex lattice that I showed you forming these pairs of dislocations. These are the edge dislocations that I was talking about. These are artificially prepared. You can see the length scale is 25 microns. These are artificially prepared colloidal lattices where you can see the formation of these pairs of dislocations. And guess what this is? This is nothing to do with materials. Actually, it's materials, but not the kind of materials that we are talking about. This is sand dunes, and you can see the length scale is 25 centimeters. If you look at patterns on sand dunes, uh, if you go out near into the beaches, uh, you can see the sand. And if you look at those sand dunes, you will see that they have these patterns, and you can see that there is clearly the same kind of dislocation type patterns here as well. So there is a self-similar behavior. These are called the Turing patterns in honor of Alan Turing. Okay. All right, so now the question is, okay, I've shown you this. Let's go back to this picture. I've shown you the energy landscape. What are the consequences? What are the physical consequences? In the next 20 minutes, I'm going to show you a few examples of that. Okay. The first thing we're going to ask is, hey, this is the energy landscape. And for if you go back to your thermodynamics classes again, uh, I'm sure they've taught you this that this is the free energy. And at this point, this red region in the square box, for example, the curvature, which is d squared u by, uh, by d p squared. That's the order parameter. So the curvature, which is really the second derivative of the free energy with respect to the order parameter, the curvature is negative. And you can clearly see that, right? It's, it's curved this way. While here, the curvature is positive. And again, if you go back to, you know, I had fantastic uh, thermodynamics teachers back in IASC in Bangalore. You know, Professor Mohan Rao did a fantastic job of teaching us this. And so um, here, the material is stable because the curvature is positive. But we are taught in our classes that when the curvature is negative, the system is here is unstable. It will naturally fall down into regions of positive curvature, meaning these stable states. So the question was, is it possible to trap systems here? In the macroscopic scale, you cannot stabilize a system with negative curvature. Okay. By the way, the second derivative of the free energy with respect to the order parameter is also the permittivity of the material. So if the curvature is negative, that means you would have negative permittivity. Okay. So what thermodynamics tells you is that you cannot have negative permittivity in the entire material. It doesn't tell you anything about whether it can happen in a dynamical situation. That's what Saif and I, we have been working on this for about 10, 12 years. We showed that when you switch a ferroelectric in time domain for a short period, you could have negative permittivity when the domain walls are moving. 
Then what we discovered, I'm going to show you that data in the next slide. What we discovered was that these vortex structures indeed trap regions of negative permittivity. And this is really fascinating. It's also a very intense field right now because a lot of people are arguing about this. So I'm going to show you data where we can directly visualize this. And the question is, what about the dynamics of such vortices? Can they be handed? Can they be chiral? Uh, if yes, can the chirality be manipulated? So that's a set of questions in the next 20 minutes before we finish up. Okay. So the one set of experiments is actually a beautiful piece of work. It is still unpublished because of some goofy reasons, some political reasons. This is the same vortices that you saw here, but um, Professor David Muller at Cornell, bar none, one of the best microscopists I've seen in the world today, one of his students worked with us on this, and you can take an angstrom electron beam and you can shine it into the vortex. Let's say this is the electron beam. And then you move the electron beam across it. As the, the electron beam is interacting with these rotating dipoles, its angular momentum will change. And therefore, that shows up as a torque. So as you know from your physics classes, the angular momentum is d tau by dt. So if I integrate it over time, and really and that means in, through the thickness of the sample, you can measure the total change in the angular momentum or the, through the torque that's transferred to the electron beam. That is plotted here for the sample. And you can see that is changing from plus h bar by two to minus h bar by two. Okay. So you can see that the electron beam is actually being influenced by the uh, by the, the vortex structure. Now the next question was, hey, can we go back? That's the same plot that I showed you. That's a torque that's introduced to the system. Can you use uh, the microscopy technique to map out the potential? And you, indeed you can. This is a holographic-like technique where you can actually measure the local potential. I'm not gonna bore you with all the details, but the, this paper, um, there's a paper that we published in, in Nature in 2019 describes this. From the two of these guys, you can reconstruct the potential energy. And you can see that clearly the potential energy has these maxima here, and there are minima in between. So you could see that this one really looks like, like this, right? Or if I just use translational symmetry, these are the points at which, which is the core of the vortex right here, where the potential energy is a maximum. And indeed, this shows up in theoretical calculations as well. And, uh, this is the same picture that I showed you. This is the polarization profile and the free energy calculated from the uh, potential distribution and the torque that gives you regions of negative curvature. So indeed, these vortices trap regions of negative curvature. And both phase field and second principles, which is ab initio simulations, show that indeed you can have these regions with a maximum uh, in the in the in the uh, uh, in the free energy, and uh, conversely, those are the regions in which you have large negative permittivity. And keep in mind, this is local. The overall permittivity of the material is still positive. It better be positive. But there's nothing that says that the local permittivity should not be negative. And indeed, they are. And so this was a very controversial piece of work because a whole bunch of people said, guys, you guys don't understand this, that you cannot have negative permittivity. Thermodynamics just tells you that you can't have negative permittivity everywhere in space you know, because that's unstable. Okay, and so this is basically the mapping of the local permittivity. You can see right at the core of the vortex, the permittivity is negative, although the overall permittivity is still positive. Okay. All right, the second aspect that we are very interested in, and this is a paper who just came out in Nature in, in April of this year, is we can use now ultra-fast uh, time domain pulses in, in this case, or you could do uh, a frequency domain as well, in this case, terahertz pulses. So what our colleagues at Argonne National Lab did was, was to, they have very fast uh, X-ray pulses, and they were shining these terahertz pulses onto these vortex-like structures and basically jiggling them. And let me show you how, what they did here. So if you look at this picture, these are the vortices, and what they were trying to do was to jiggle them in a very coherent way, and they called that the vortex on. And if you look at this picture, that has a very specific frequency around uh, 200 gigahertz or so, uh, where there's a very large peak that doesn't show up otherwise. 
Now, if you look at these calculations, these are ab initio calculations, that's one mode where it's going like this, left, right. The second one is more interesting. This is what, what you would call the scissor mode. It's going up, down. So these vortices are going up, down, back and forth, like a seesaw. You know, uh, what do you call them? You go to the playgrounds, you have the seesaw. This is doing exactly that. And so these are now coherent uh, oscillations of the, uh, of the vortex, vortex lattice, and that's called a vortex song. It's like a new mode of, of these materials. Okay, all right. So we're getting uh, close to the, um, the final part. The last part of this has to do with chirality, you know, and then a quick discussion on chemistry. And I, I, if, if, when you guys took your chemistry classes, I'm sure they talked about racemic mixtures, D-glucose and L-glucose. And it's very fascinating because the human system for some goofy reason can only assimilate D-glucose. And if you take L-glucose, you will just pass it right through. For the same reason, all of the amino acids that we use are all L amino acids and people are still arguing about it. You know, People talk about, oh, you know what, out in space, something broke parity, the hydrogen, uh, uh, there was a small mutation. So a very small fraction of that became uh, L. And so that led to it. I don't think this is ever resolved. But if you look at, um, uh, you know, uh, sugar molecules, you know that they are handed either left-handed, L, LAVO, or right-handed, or dextro, or D. Okay, So chirality is a measure of the handedness. It's a geometric property of objects where the image of the object is not superimposable onto, its, onto the object itself. And typically, you would measure this with optical activity. You know, in olden days, you would just dissolve the sugar into water and do optical measurements. Now we do circular dichros, and I'm going to give you a quick brief uh, summary of that. And it's a very fundamental aspect of nature. Okay, so the question is, are these vortices chiral? And it turns out that they are. So the way we probe that is a very sophisticated X-ray based technique called resonant soft X-ray diffraction. Uh, you guys have done X-ray diffraction in your class and lambdas, 2D, sine theta, all those things. So if I now have an array of these kinds of vortices, I can come in on the X-ray beam, I will get diffraction. And those are the diffraction spots corresponding to the periodicity of the, of the vortex. That's about 11 nanometers. Okay. That's the Q for that. But now if you go and sit at this value of Q and go in and do spectroscopy, which is shown here, then you can look at specific energy resolved measurements or chemically resolved measurements as well. This is the titanium absorption edge. So you sit here in Q space and go into spectroscopic space and look at the absorption at titanium. Now titanium, which has uh, you know, a certain electronic structure, in, in XAS, X-ray absor absorption spectroscopy, you hit the, the material with a soft X-ray, for example, and you kick out an electron, that then goes into states in the 3D level, empty states, for example. So it really maps out these empty states. So this absorption, in some sense, is a measure of the electronic structure of the system. And for titanium, you get this very characteristic uh, structure. Now, you can go into this and start to use circularly polarized x-rays. If this x-ray is polarized this way versus this way, then you would start to see very big differences if the material is chiral. And so you can use. Uh, uh, these kinds of techniques, which are pretty sophisticated. But if you go to indoor, you can do these kinds of measurements, or you can go to Trieste uh, in Italy and do those measurements. So you can probe local environments. You can use linear and circularly polarized X-rays. You can look at orbitals, ferroelectricity, magnetism, chirality. Okay. So this is just a quick summary. Uh, let, let me go forward because we're running out of time. Um, so when we did this resonant uh, a soft X-ray diffraction, you could see that that's a specular peak, and those are the peaks coming from the vortices. Now, the red and the blue are with light with positive helicity and negative helicity, and you can see they're not the same. The difference between them is shown here in green. That's called circular dichroism, and typically, you observe circular dichroism with circularly polarized light, 
only under certain conditions. If the material is a ferromagnet, i.e. it breaks time reversal symmetry, then you would see circular dichroism, for example, in cobalt or iron or something. Okay. But in this case, we see circular dichroism. It turns out that there is one more pathway by which you can see circular dichroism, which is natural optical activity okay, or natural chirality. There are some materials which are naturally chiral. Okay. The fact that it is anti-symmetric positive for positive Q and negative for negative Q is also an indication of chirality or a broken mirror symmetry. Okay. So we also know that this X-ray circular dichroism in resonant mode is observed only when the vortices are preserved. When you have classical ferroelectric domains, you don't see any circular dichroism. So what we are now seeing is, is that, that these things, these vortex arrays have a sense of handedness to them. Okay. So, uh, one of my students, uh, Piyush, is working on looking at other pathways. Uh, how does one measure it, not with sophisticated x-rays, but by regular optical measurements? And so, what he's been, let me quickly go through this. These are the vortex arrays, and it turns out that these guys go up, down, up, down. They're not flat. They're going up and down. So, the up-down movement of the, of the, of the vortices which is shown here, also gives another source of chirality in the system. And what Piyush has been doing is trying to study them with not with a synchrotron, but with a regular optical uh, microscope. And in this case, you can use uh, uh, basically left circular or right circular polarized uh, uh, um, light, and you can do second harmonic measurement. You come in with 800 nanometer light, and you get the doubling of the of the, of the harmonic, you go out with 400 nanometers of light. But it turns out that when you do, do this imaging with left and right, those images are not the same. And the difference between them, which is a circular dichroism in second harmonic, looks very much like this. And then what Piyush and his collaborators, we just got this paper accepted in science, they showed that you can put metal wires here, these black lines are metal wires, and you can switch these guys back and forth. And that back and forth switching is shown here, repeated switching back and forth. And you can indeed go through a circular dichroism hysteresis that's shown here in this plot. And that's interesting because it's telling you that for the first time, you can manipulate the, the chirality or the helicity or the circular dichroism in this case, which is the blue data as a function of electric field and make it go from positive to negative. Superimposed on this is also the ferroelectric hysteresis loop, the in-plane ferroelectric loop, which is shown in red. And the theoretical calculations are in orange and in green. They all qualitatively or semi-quantitatively agreed that you can indeed manipulate the chirality with an electric field. So think about this, right? Imagine that you had D-glucose and you applied an electric field and you converted it into L-glucose. And that's not possible, but in case it is possible, that's pretty much what this is saying. Therefore, you can use electric fields to manipulate this. Okay, so... Um, oh, let me skip through this. This is just too much details for this. We've done a lot of electron microscopy. We've shown that as a function of electric field, these vortices which go up, down like this, after switching, they go, they invert. And that's the, the source of the chirality and stuff. Okay, In the last five minutes or so, I wanna show you one more piece of work and then absolutely we finish up. Now it turns out that I showed you with these vortices, these are long wire-like things. Those are formed because of the epitaxial growth on a substrate, and we call it dysprosium scandate or disco, which is slightly larger than the lead titanate lattice parameter. So in some sense, the film is under tensile stress, and that's why it forms these wire-like structures. Now, if you went to a substrate like strontium titanate, which is slightly compressive or something which is even more compressive, you start to form bubble-like structures. And these are also topological objects, and they're called skirmions. And there is a magnetic analog of these, but these are the electrical analogs. And uh, so one of the postdocs working in our group, he just went back to China as a professor. He worked out the phase diagram for this. And these skirmions look like this. These are high resolution images of the skirmions. They look like circles, actually. It turns out they're a lot more sophisticated than simply circles, but I'm going to show you just one picture of how they look like. But before we get into the characterization of the skirmions, the properties or the attributes of skirmions, 
um, they are characterized by an integral topological charge. It's called the skirmian number. NSK is called the skirmian number. It's basically a surface integral. D squared R over the surface of this N is, is a normalized local dipole moment. And you can clearly see there is a cross product here, which is already telling you something about a curling dipole moment along the X and Y direction, which is in the plane. So the integrand, uh, this guy is called the Pontergrin density. Okay. And so the N, N skirmion can also be written in this form where V is the vorticity of the, of the, uh, of the skirmion. Okay. This is what they look like. These are actual calculations, ab initio calculations, but then made into Bollywood movie kind of structure. You can see all of the fancy dipoles and stuff. And this fellow was, is a really a theorist, but he did more, uh, more fun stuff uh, visualizing. Each one of these is a skirmion and they form into these arrays of, of uh, about seven, eight nanometers. You can look at them uh, again with electron microscopy. This is a uh, um, head of stem, uh, scanning transmission electron microscopy, or something called 4D stem, which I won't have time to get into. This is a very sophisticated technique. And you can then pick up the in-plane component of these skirmions, which in this picture is this red belt that's going. Now you can already start to think that if this belt, these arrows are going from left to right, maybe this is a left-handed skirmion. It doesn't have to, it could go from right to left, then you would have a right-handed skirmion. So it's exactly like our belt that we wear. You know, I'm left-handed, so I, have, uh, I wear from left to right. But if you're right-handed, you go from right to left, left. So you will have handedness also for the skirmions. And these are the images of the electron microscopy images of the skirmions. These are the calculations which actually show the in-plane component, which we call the block component for the skirmion. And that was this paper that Shudit Das uh, published. He's going back to Bangalore as a professor in January. We also showed by, I'm not going to go into the details, uh, beautiful piece of work. We showed that indeed they also show very large circular dichroism. That dichroism is shown here. And it is also asymmetric. So the skirmions are also chiral objects. And so we're now trying to understand other properties. Now, one of the things which is very interesting, again, relates back to the negative permittivity I talked about, is the fact that if you measure, if you have a structure like this, this is the super lattice multi layers, and you put metal contacts and you measure the dielectric permittivity, this is the macroscopic measurement, it shows a value of about 800. Okay. But if you go back to your double E classes, I mean, I'm sure you guys have taken some classes in physics or something, series capacitors and parallel capacitors. We are taught that if I have capacitors in series, the net capacitance is smaller than the smallest of, uh, of the individual layers. If I have like titanate, permittivity is around 70, 80 or so. Strontium titanate is about 150. The permittivity of the series ensemble should be this green line, except it's here. You say, hey, what happened? That is a consequence against of the fact that around the periphery of the skirmion, around this region, you have re you have now around the periphery of the skirmion regions of negative permittivity. That again, when you measure that negative permittivity in the vertical direction, you start to get very large enhancements. When you apply an electric field to it, that enhancement goes away because you now convert the skirmion into a uniform polarization, which is shown in this, in this movie. You start with the skirmion-like structures with applied field, they start to go away. At some point, there is a phase transition into a uniform polar state. When you take the field away, the skirmions will come back because they're the ground state for the system. Okay. All right. I think I've said enough about this. We've done a lot of calculations about how to prove it. There's a lot of back and forth. This paper took us about two years to publish because a lot of people did not believe it. They asked for this data, that data. They asked for high frequency. Uh, they asked us for to do leakage measurements, etc. But in the end, we basically proved that at the periphery of the skirmions, you have regions of negative permittivity. For example, if you look at the schematic, you have the strontium titanate layer, and then you have these skirmion bubbles in the lead titanate. And right around the periphery, which is the purple region, are the regions where you have negative permittivity in the system. The permittivity of the overall system is very positive. Okay. All right.
let's come to the conclusion. Now, what did I start with this whole game? We took a system such as lead titanate, a very classical ferroelectric system, and we asked some questions of it. We said, is it true that the dipoles never rotate? Is it true that the dipole moment can be mutated? What we realized was, oh yeah, that's true, but not always true. The dipoles can rotate, as you, can, as you saw in these curling patterns of, of uh, polar textures. You can use epitaxy as a pathway to create model systems. You could put many different gradients uh, in the system by changing the layer thickness, blah, blah, blah. Many of these are materials parameters. You can change the structural motif in the system. You could change the degree of octahedral tilts that you have in the system. I showed you data on emergent topologies, kermions and vortices, that they're electrically co controllable, that we can manipulate the energy landscape uh, by putting in these kinds of textures, which leads to non-conventional susceptibility or even negative permittivity. What we think we can do, and this is really what we're working on, is we have a way to start to create magnetoelectric coupling. Actually, we just submitted a paper to Nature, which is going back and forth. One of my postdocs is working on it. We, can, we don't have to stop there. You can start to confine and, and uh, create electronic uh, uh, states right at this interface. That's been a very hot topic in our field for a while now, where you, people have put two different materials and create a 2D gas right at this interface. There's a lot of fun things. And if you guys are thinking about doing a PhD, this is a great uh, field to be in. This, again, from topology perspective, there's immense possibilities. You can create disclinations, polar labyrinths. Uh, these are, the theory guys are going crazy on this. You can create vortex tubes and tri uh, stripes. You can create skirmions, anti-skirmions, merons, blah, blah, blah. The whole um, zoo of, of topological objects can be explored. There's a lot to be learned, a lot of new physics to be done in the system. So let me just finish up by saying thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I've told you about the vortex lattices and polar skirmions, chirality in both of them, negative permittivity in both of them. And I've shown you some data on some kind of phase transitions in these systems, as well as uh, field-driven transitions. There's clearly a lot more to come in this. So let me stop there, Tarun, and very happy to take questions. Thank you very much, sir. It was a really enlightening lecture. Uh, we didn't know about any of this as like second year students, so it was really interesting to learn about the latest <laughs> I hope it was not too over the top, but that's okay. You can, you guys are young people. You can go read stuff. Yes, sir. Yeah. So we're open to questions. You can either type yeah. it in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself, that's also okay. Yeah. Either way is okay. Uh, Raman here. Uh, Professor Raman, you had a question. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for a very very impressive lecture. Yeah. Maybe a little bit of the mathematics was going above the heads, but definitely students should have grasped the main theme yeah. of your lecture. I have a couple of questions. Number one. Please. Yeah. Uh, what are the device or engineering applications you foresee from emerging from these concepts? over the next few years? Yeah, so the first thing is, of course, this business of negative permittivity, Professor Raman, is very hot topic now, but uh, we don't necessarily use these polar textures. Just the idea of negative permittivity is very interesting in, um, in CMOS logic, because if you look at it, CMOS is now going through a big change because of you know the power consumption is going up. There's a big concern that, uh, uh, that electronics could easily consume 25, 30% of total global energy because of AI, machine learning, and all of these things happening. So one of the ways to reduce that is by putting a ferroelectric in series with your gate dielectric in a CMOS device. So that's one possibility. Uh, let me see if I, uh, if I can show you one more example. I think I went through it a little bit quickly uh, because I just didn't want to kill you guys with too much detail. So if you look at this, uh, let me go to this one. So this is uh, the dielectric permittivity is exactly the same data as I showed you here. This was measured at one megahertz. Okay, that's not very high frequency. This data here is basically doing the same measurement all the way up to about 100 gigahertz. 
Uh, this is 10 gigahertz, this is 100 gigahertz. And you can see that the dielectric permittivity enhancement is still there even at 100 gigahertz. And we think we can go all the way up to about 200, 250 gigahertz. So if you think about it, these are all tunable dielectrics with 75% tunability of the dielectric constant. So for radar applications, phased array radar, or high frequency application, that's one of the things we're thinking about. Now, one topic that I didn't discuss is we, not, we are, of course, very interested in electric field control of magnetism for, you know, for a whole bunch of applications. It turns out that you can actually do those kinds of experiments with these vortices and skirmions and stuff. Uh, but yeah, th no, thank you. That was very informative. Yeah. My second and last question, pardon me if it is a little tangential. Uh, do you foresee any possibility of oxygen? Professor Raman, you were a little bit choppy. Based semiconductors. Yeah, I didn't get your full question. You were a little bit choppy. Can you repeat it? Yeah. See, you're working on oxide systems. Mm -hmm. My question is, do you foresee a possibility that oxide semiconductors have a chance of completely challenging the conventional silicon-based semiconductors? That's a great question. That's an awesome question. By the way, that was the second topic that I proposed to Rishika, and she said, no, no, this looks very interesting. Talk about this. My other work, I mean, about 60% of my research is focused on asking one question. If you look at, if you fast forward 20 years from today, electronics is going to look different for a simple reason. If you don't do anything else to CMOS, which is the basis for all of electronics, you're going to consume 25 to 30% of primary energy, which means you still have to build a lot of new power plants. And therefore, efficiency of computing is uh, energy efficiency of computing is going to be a big deal in the years to come. And therefore, what we've been saying is, hey, look, we cannot just stick to Boltzmann statistics, which is what the uh, semiconductors are based on. We need to start to use internal degrees of freedom like magnetism or ferroelectricity or magnetoelectricity. So we are working feverishly on devices which would function at 100 millivolts, for example. You know, your, your chip in your computer is probably working at 1.2 volts. How do you reduce that to 100 millivolts and then to 10 millivolts? The reason for that is voltage is really a, a place marker for energy. You know, for a capacitor is CV squared, basically. One half CV squared is the total energy. And therefore, voltage is in some sense a marker for energy. So we are deep into this business of looking at either negative capacitance, which is what Saif is leading, and I work very closely with him, or looking at uh, you know these totally new architectures. And about three years ago, with our colleagues at Intel, we published a paper which was talking about a magnetoelectric spin orbit coupled logic and memory device. What it what it's planning to do is we are working on the physics of it now, is to see if you can bring logic and memory together. Which means if you open up your computer, your logic chip is somewhere and the memory chip is somewhere. Therefore, much of the energy is just going back and forth between logic and memory. The question is, what happens if, like the brain, you can do logic and memory in the same device? So we are trying to build those kinds of devices where you take a memory, like a ferroelectric, which has got bistable states. But can you do logic with them? You know, how do you do uh, addition, subtractions, uh, and or all of those operations? How do you do that? That's what we're working on. There's a lot of progress happening. So for sure, you're going to see new materials. The periodic table is going to get opened up for semiconductors. For sure. That's a great question. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time. Thank you. You're most welcome. Any other questions from the students? Navneet, Rajiv, yes. Uh, thank you, sir, for the lecture. Uh, it was, uh, many of the parts were simple to understand, in fact. Uh, Good, and, that's great. Uh, sir, uh, I was just doubtful, uh, like, you have performed a lot of ab initio uh, simulations as well to study the system. Uh, mm -hmm. 
so since you told uh, there's a the periodic table is opening up uh, will you be trying material informatics on a task oh, great question navneet that's a great question literally that's what we're doing it's called the materials project you know um, it turns out that uh, you know ab initio that's a fantastic question navneet uh, ab initio has become so sophisticated so we have a big uh, department of energy funded program which literally just got started about 2 months ago where we are again start, trying to look for energy efficient electronics so one of the things that we're doing is to say how does one use the power of ab initio uh, 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 com computation to discover new materials so our circuit designers or people who are working at the upper level of the food chain they give us specs for what they want for this let's say an auto joule switch hey you need to get to 50 millivolt operation you need this much of polarization or etc cetera, etc cetera. and you can go take it to the ab initio computer and say hey tell me what material it probably will tell you go to beam titanate but it could tell you a totally new wacky material which it has discovered by computational techniques that is going to become a huge part of the learning process you don't have to do the edisonian hey let me try one let me try again blah 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 you can go to ab initio and basically you know ditch 80 90% of the useless information and focus on the 10% which can give real experimental data so this is happening ferociously right now thank you professor yeah great question navni all right tarun back to you Yeah. Oh, why scientists are attracted toward organic electronics i'm not sure they're attracted there's a big bunch of people doing organic electronics but i think uh, people are uh, it depends on what your programming is you know it depends on what your advisors doing and, and stuff like that you know we don't do much organic stuff at all we're all in organics people we're epitaxy people yeah and for the some reason organics of course the you can do is very flexible synthesis is easy you don't need high temperatures those are all valuable things but i'm not sure if uh, you know if you're doing silicon silicon is a huge business 500 billion dollar business so people there's a large number of people doing uh, research on cmos and those kinds of things tarun back to you yes sir we'll just wait for a few more minutes if anybody else has any other questions yeah Then by the way professor raman uh, that aditya was not aditya rangan aditya mishra oh okay okay thank thank you for correcting me sir thank you yeah yeah he went to san diego you see san diego i keep in touch with him because you know i was hoping that he would come to berkeley but you know the admissions here is pretty screwy so he went to uc san diego okay anyway our students will definitely make use of your goodwill very happy to very happy to yeah, yeah. thank you yeah. thank you professor yeah. Okay guys no other questions um sir one last question yes so on your website you talk about the control of thermal effects in materials and like how to convert waste heat to electrical energy yeah yeah so how did that well uh, if you remember i started by saying that we were looking to understand phonon transport now one reason that's important is if you want to make a thermoelectric a thermoelectric basically converts heat into electricity it turns out i mean that's a very difficult problem and you know, there's only a few material like bismuth selenide or bismuth telluride which have good efficiency even bismuth selenide has only uh, a third of uh, carnot efficiency you know carnot efficiency typically is around 30% you know the bismuth selenide thermoelectric conversion efficiency is about 10% The, the the reason is because typically when you have heat transport electrons carry a lot of that heat and so that's not useful because they also carry the current so the figure of merit is some ratio of the electrical conductivity the the seebeck effect which is s the seebeck effect divided by the thermal conductivity so our thinking was hey can we use these kinds of artificially synthesized materials to strongly suppress the thermal conductivity how do you make a thermal glass is it a material where well, glass for example has very low thermal conductivity but it also has very poor electrical conductivity so it's not that good but if you can make something which is electrically a good metal you know or conductor or even at least a semiconductor but thermally is a glass or an insulator 
those are very good quality uh, thermoelectric materials for a waste heat conversion. So well, I had a former student who is somewhere from Trichy. Now he's a big professor at the USC in California, in, in Los Angeles, uh, University of Southern California. Now Jaikant worked on this with me and Arun Majumdar um, on looking at oxides for thermal uh, um, energy conversion. And so that's where we got started on these super lattices. But now we are really looking at other things with that. OK, thank you very much, sir. Yep. I think we can close the session now. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. And be well, be safe. We'll see you guys soon sometime. Yeah. I'm going to sign off now, Tarun. Yeah, good night. Sorry. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Professor. Yeah.